Seeing that right. it's 7 o'clock, I'm calling to order the Monday, November 11, 2024, Planning and Development Committee meeting to order. Please call the roll. So, Kytus? Here. Folks? Here. Bungard? Here. Munz? Here. Lencioni? Yes. Kim? Here. Petrilla? Here. Werbaugh? Here. Esner? Here. Weber? Here. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll proceed on to the omnibus vote. Looking, so moved. Uh, motion by Petrella. Second. Second by Werbaugh. Uh, please call the roll. Esner? Yes. Weber? Yes. Fokaitis? Yes. Folks? Yes. Bungard? Yes. Munz? Yes. Kim? Yes. Petrilla? Yes. Werbaugh? Yes. That passes. Thank you. Moving on to item four, community and economic development. Uh, item A, presentation of a concept plan for Emblem St. Charles. Good evening. A concept plan has been filed by Cortera <clears throat> Multifamily Communities proposing a residential development on the 29-acre site on the south side of Route 38, known as Britcher Commons. The site is zoned regional commercial with a comprehensive plan land use designation of corridor regional commercial and industrial business park. Uh, the project includes 288 multifamily units and 72 townhomes. Um, plan Commission reviewed the concept plan last month. Um, they expressed support for the residential land use density and design. They offered some comments related to um, building placement and incorporating more recreational opportunities as well as roadway layout. Um, the St. Charles Park District has requested a public park site for this, a public park donation for this site. Um, the developer has stated that they are looking to provide this at the north end. Um, the applicant is seeking feedback on this concept plan. If they choose to pursue the project further, zoning applications would need to be filed and that, that would go through the city's process. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to the developer. Jeff Wall is here representing Corterra. Mr. Wall, please state your name for the record. Uh, good evening, my name is Jeff Wall, W-O-L-L. -L. I work for Corterra Multifamily Communities, and I office out of 300 Park Boulevard in Itasca, Illinois. With me tonight is Rick Murphy, representing Lenar Homes. Um, I think the big differentiator there is Corterra, who, the company that I work for. Uh, my primary responsibility is apartments for rent. Rick's primary responsibility is homes for sale, and that is Lenar's job. So. You will be hearing from both of us tonight. I will be going over the apartment component. Rick will then come up and go over the townhome component. Um, a couple slides here, uh, company history. Um, I don't need to spend too much time. Lennar, obviously very established in Chicagoland region. Um, been working uh, on building homes since 1954. Very active as of late um, with 1,500 homes in 2023. Corterra, not nearly as old, we're about 15 years old. Um, the only thing I want to highlight on this slide is that we are fully integrated. What does that mean? Um, from land acquisition to development to construction, property management and asset management, it's all in-house. So that's all within Corterra. Um, it would not be a third party coming in after a certain stage from today if the project were to go through, all the way through to property management um, and leasing up, that's all a Corterra employee. So what are our goals? Um, our goals on the proposed site provide a variety of quality housing options, support the railroad corridor with additional residents, provide accessible housing near public amenities, um, national green building standard, which is a uh, green certification for the apartments, and that demonstrate quality that is consistent with city standards. And quality obviously on the final built product, but we also want to demonstrate quality throughout the process. Diving into the site, you guys are all very familiar with the framework plan. The subject site is bottom center, highlighted in red. Um, or designated as industrial business use within the land use plan, but with an opportunity for residential. Um, assuming that the densities in built form are similar to that of adjacent residential parcels. Um, some other things I wanted to highlight on the comp plan goals that we were attracted to, diversity, quality, character, safety, affordability, and appeal of residential neighborhoods, that's preservation and enhancing. Um, <laughs> take advantage of local goods and services and then an opportunity to age in place as well. So um, diving in a little bit further, uh, the Berkshire Comets PUD uh, originally picked up in 1999. Um, that was annexed into St. Charles. 
rezoning from an estate residence district to a B3, which is a general business. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, in 2006, it was amended to include residential and commercial uses. That's the picture on the right. And then in 2018, Prairie Winds Apartments came in on the far south side, just north of Brisher Avenue, and developed 250 apartments. The general area that we are focusing on is the remainder 30 acres, which sits immediately west of the Meyer and Lowe's development, north of Prairie Winds Residential east of Kane County Services and south of Kane County Fairgrounds and some light industrial just north off of 38. The proposed development um, is split into two quadrants. The eastern quadrant would ho house approximately 12 residential buildings, three stories each building with 24 units in each building. Those are the apartments for rent. Um, that program also includes a clubhouse that would be used for the uh, tenants of the apartments. On the west side, it's uh, townhomes for sale, and that's 18 buildings, 72 townhomes in all. The current grading of the site uh, kind of puts all of the stormwater detention on the far western side, so we are buffered from the western property line with detention, and then that pond on the east side is Meyer and <coughs> existing detention pond. Um, so that is in place. And then obviously the Metro self storage um, up in the corner. We're proposing a number of ingress and egress points. Primary access would be off Illinois Route 38. We are aware that that is I dot uh, coordination. Secondary would be taking advantage of an existing vehicular easement south of Metro self storage. And then we are proposing um, a third emergency ingress egress only in the southeast corner. That obviously goes right on to Myers' private property, um, and those conversations are ongoing. On screen now is a rendering um, of the apartment building. As I mentioned, they are three stories tall, uh, 24 units per building. They are enclosed breezeways that get you access to each floor. Those are all access controlled. And then each unit will have a recessed balcony or patio, one or the other. Um, the building exterior materials are primarily cementitious um, paneling and masonry. A few images of the proposed clubhouse. Um, the clubhouse will have on-site leasing offices, management offices, uh, fitness center, package concierge program, uh, locker rooms, restrooms, and a social lounge. A couple of images of the interiors. Um, luxury vinyl plank throughout uh, the majority of the apartment, carpet in the bedrooms. They're all nine foot ceilings, quartz countertops, stainless steel appliance package, 42 inch upper cabinets. Um, LED lighting package. And this is a lot of information. I'll use this as a reference slide um, to come back to need be, but I do want to highlight the square footages and the asking rents. So the community is mostly one and two bedrooms split, uh, and then we have an additional 12 three bedrooms that's proposed. The one bedrooms will range between 730 and 775 square feet, and the asking rent will be between 17 and $1,900. The two bedrooms will range between 1,000 and 1,200 square feet, um, and those asking rents will range between 21 and 24. And then the three bedrooms will be around 1,400 square feet with an asking rent of 28 to 31. Who do we think will live here? Um, the target demographic is a resident looking for local entertainment and activity, uh, active user of parks, recreational facilities, a 55 plus looking to downsize with a simplified housing experience. Young couples looking to save for a home, looking for a simplified um, living experience. And then young signals establishing a professional career. Uh, teachers, firefighters, police officers. These are actual images um, of a similar community that we just finished up in Oswego, Illinois. So the residential building, bottom right, clubhouse, top left. Um, this was 312 units compared to the 288 that we are proposing. But this, is, this community was very successful, leased up um, as anticipated, 
and kind of provided a lot of the data that we were looking for in terms of the target demographics and the rent ranges, the sizes, all of that was playing out or has played out rather in Oswego uh, with a lot of success. And now I'll turn it over to Rick to talk to you about townhomes. Good evening. Uh, thanks for hearing us tonight. Uh, I wanted to Before we get started, would you state your name? Oh, I'm sorry. Rick Murphy. I'm with Lenart Homes, uh, and uh, my address is uh, uh, 1700 East Golf Road, Schaumburg, Illinois. Uh, I wanted to let you know I did win the uh, arm wrestling, and we got the home sites by the, the ponds. <laughs> so. Um, I think very compatible uh, product in homes, and, and when folks are, you know, done with renting, they can just pack their boxes and carry them, you know, across the street. You know, as you probably know, we're, we're working a lot of communities nearby, um, South Elgin, Elgin, Algonquin, um, Aurora, New Hampshire, so we're pretty busy. And I, I think the main thrust of that comment is, you know, Stability and the financial resources to perform and get things done. We don't go to outside lenders. In fact, we have our own mortgage company, and we have a lot of incentives for uh, loan programs and figure out how to get people in homes. Um, moving on to the uh, architecture, we do offer three different models, and a lot of the reason is that is so we can, you know create some uh, differential on the front elevation, so we've got some smaller and larger ones, and start to get mixed materials and some of the setbacks forward and, and reverse in order to uh, get some interesting uh, elevations on the front. This is a rendering. These are our, our actual photos of, of uh, Liberty Meadows, Meadows is in um, Aurora. So I think, I don't know if I told you, 70, about 1,764 square, square feet up to 2,079. So these are quite large for a townhome. A lot of townhomes you see are typically more than the 1,600, 1,700 square feet. So you've basically got two, two and a half floors here. There's a, there's a, a, a kind of a flex room on the first, right in front of the garage, and then you've got more of a traditional um, main living floor and uh, bedrooms on top. So some basic floor plans and um, designer spec level, a very similar finish. You know, basically we show our homes pretty close to how, how you buy them. So the upgrades are built in. We call that designer. That's vinyl plank flooring, 42 inch cabinets, quartz countertops, double bowl sinks in the owner's uh, suite. Uh, Bats, uh, enclosed showers, and so forth, um, and stainless steel appliances where we have them. So, again, I think uh, very compatible products, but yet we'll have separation between the two and uh, <coughs> uh, a very good blend. So, I think uh, with that, I think we're ready to either turn it back or open for questions. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. We appreciate your presentation. Uh, back to council uh, for comments. I'll start over here. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chairman Lencioni. Um, I, I I like the project a lot. The way the way it looks, I like the uh, the ingress egress. I think multiple access points are going to be really important for this this project. That way, people, depending on if they're going, um, you know, east or west on 38 or north or south on Randall, it's good that they have multiple options because I feel like that. That Route 38 one's going to be a little tricky, at least going going west. So I like that they can use the light at the mire. Um, is regards to uh, like, is there going to be fencing all around the property? We currently don't have any fencing proposed. I mean, the, one of the reasons we're attracted to the site is really to promote the pedestrian connection to all the amenities to the east. Um, and, and there's no reason, given the existing buffers and the adjacent uses, that we found fencing would be necessary. What about, I know that there were some comments at the Planning Commission regarding uh, sidewalks and stuff like that. Are you going to be putting sidewalks around any of the detention ponds or anything like that for the neighbors to walk around? Um, so what we're looking at right now is continuing the sidewalk 
for the extent of our northern property line um, from where it stops there at the self-storage all the way to the western property line. And then we'll have a, a network of paths that will either be on the east or west side of the wetlands, but they will go over to the west side of the property. Um, there's an existing easement on the property line that we're just being sensitive to, and we also have some stormwater management coordination that Rick and I need to have um, in terms of access and the ability to maintain them. Um, but to respond to the comments, we will be increasing the network, and part of that network will go on the west side of the townhomes, whether it's on the east or west side of the detention ponds is still to be determined. Okay, just because a lot of the stuff that we've been, you know, dealing with late, as of lately was, you know, bikeability, walkability with everything. So um, I just wanted to make sure that that's being addressed. So, yep. Thank you. I'll go next. Yeah, go thank you very much. Go down the line. <clears throat> this is a good looking plan, at least right now at the concept stage. Uh, we had the opportunity to look at a plan, I wouldn't say completely similar to this, but going back a few years, as you probably know, they did talk at the time, if I'm not mistaken, about affordability and accessible housing. So I'm not here pushing that one way or the other, but my question to you is, were there any thoughts on doing any of those physical units versus just the Lua fee and Lua fee? Mm -hmm. um, the application submitted suggests that they would be in lieu of fee. Mm -hmm. um, I will say, though, that we are in communication with King County and select individuals trying to figure out if there's an opportunity to put a percentage. I can say we won't be able to most likely hit the 10% requirement, okay. um, but we are entertaining uh, a smaller percentage to be actual units on this site. I can't commit to anything at this point, but mm -hmm. I can tell you that we are 100% looking into it. And then single family homes, is that just something that would not work here in Europe? I don't want to speak for Rick, but I'm assuming that's the case. Yeah, um, multifamily, or uh, not multifamily, but the, the town homes are really at 72. Mm -hmm. It's really that the 72 units have to start to carry, you know, the loads. And that's, we go into single family, it's even tougher. I got you. And then um, <clears throat> lastly, well, one, the land use, I believe, is compatible with, as you showed on your map, I live in the subdivision, actually, by Harvest Hills, so I could see how that would spread out easily. We know about um, uh, Prairie Landing has done a phenomenal job in occupying that place, I believe, at about 90 95%, if I'm not mistaken. So I agree with all that. Um, the density, it seems like it's kind of right in the middle there a little bit, depending on uh, how you want to look at it, but it's not anything that's overly uh, extensive, I guess. And then the only other thing, going back to what uh, Council Member Weber was suggesting in regards to pedestrian connectivity, is, is there talk or is there a design to try to connect somehow into that Meyer Shopping Center, whether it's <clears throat> not so much for cars, but for pedestrian? <laughs> that came, excuse me, I'm sorry, that came up the last time uh, when we revisited right. this as well. Right, so. and we, I, I want to be careful on, on what we're able to commit to because, mm -hmm. I mean, Meyer is it's privately owned, right? And obviously they want our residents to be shopping at their store. So we have been talking to them. It's ongoing conversation about both ingress, egress, and also how do we safely get our residents from this 30-acre parcel into your front door? Mm -hmm. Uh, without putting anyone in a tough situation. Um, what we have boiled it down to is that residents find the path of least resistance eventually. Um, prairie winds actually just south of the screen. Um, there was a road that was stubbed from Meyer uh, going west and it, and it dies right into their community and they have a sidewalk that comes out and it's utilized. And they walk out to the east, they walk through the sidewalk, they walk right past the loading zone around the corner and up. And if I had to guess, our residents will most likely either walk on 38 where it will be safe in the sidewalk or they'll work their way down to the southeast corner. The agreement that we make with them will be for emergency ingress, egress mm -hmm. only. I can't, I, I can't enter um, a sidewalk right into their loading zone. And unfortunately, to get down to the area that I'm referring to with prairie winds, that's would, have, would require going on Prairie Winds property. So I'm trying to communicate with Prairie Winds. Um, I'm trying to communicate with Meyer. We're trying to figure this out. Right now, the only thing we can guarantee that if 
the pedestrian connection safely on a sidewalk will be off 38. Okay. Yeah, I, I would just, I mean, everything's great. I, I like the way it's flowing right now, but I would ask that you constantly kind of look at that because we're, as everybody knows here, we're in a situation now with connectivity that we're kind of trying to connect sidewalks that should have probably been connected years ago. So we're just right. trying to stay on top of that. Yep, understood. Thank you. Yep. Uh, thank you for your presentation. So I'm, I'm okay with the land use. Um, I'm just curious, what, what is the price range for the townhouses? Uh, right now, we're expecting them to be over 400. 400,000, okay. Yeah. Um, so I noticed reading through the packet that there's um, engineering review that needs to happen with the, with the water pressure, water modeling, uh, potential electric upgrades, uh, you know, a lot of infrastructure that you need to look at. Um, the traffic study, um, do you anticipate the traffic study, you're going to do that on Route 38. Is that where that's going to happen, the, the exit? Yeah, that will be studied, and uh, we anticipate um, trying to figure out a way to get uh, full access on 38. Do you anticipate a traffic light there, or is that going to be determined by IDOT? It, it's also determined by IDOT. Uh, what I would foresee is, you know, it's not like um, adding signals is an easy thing with IDOT, but we do foresee some some improvements up on okay. So all the Okay, so all the infrastructure improvements, you guys are going to uh, plan on incurring the costs of that? We're, we're open to figure it out. Okay. Um, and then the other piece of it is the, the um, affordable housing piece. Um, something that I'm just curious about and, and is Behind Jewel on Randall Road, they have a place called Anthony Place, and that's affordable senior housing. And it's just one building. Is that something you would consider one building uh, by Meyer? And the one that I'm looking at is like building number 12 that's close to Meyer. So I'm, I'm just interested if that's, I don't need an answer tonight, but if you can consider one building with 24 units for senior housing, affordable senior housing, something to think about. Um, overall, I'm okay with it, but uh, th that's just my, those are my thoughts for right now. <clears throat> Thank you. Oh, sure. Um, actually, this question, quick one for you, Ellen. Um, in the packet, <clears throat> when you describe, or not, when the packet described uh, the three, or the RM3 zoning, um, there was a mention in there of institutional uses. What, what is, in the, there's a description of what um, RM3 is used for. Do you know, off the top of your head, do you know what that, what, what do you mean by that? I'm just, was curious. Um, I, I, let me like, see if I can find it. Um, I'd have to look into at the definition okay. of what that's referring to. The reason I ask is just because I, I mean, I'm okay with the rezoning because it's going from BR to, to RM3. And it appears to me, um, you know, of course, being a former plan commissioner as well, that it, it does meet more it's more applicable to this use. So I just saw that in the description for limited institutional uses. I don't know. When I hear institution, I'm thinking like a government building or something, but I'm sure there's no. Yeah, um, I can get back to you on cool. the definition of that. But that. this would likely be a PUD, so the PUD would further right. um, define what uses are allowed. Got it, got it. No, I was going to mention. Yeah, if, it, if I could just add, I think um, institutional uses, because it's a residential district, it might be something like a, a nursing home or an assisted living Got facility it. or some type of managed uh, residential development. Right. To, hence why it's a more diverse types of housing and things. Got it. <clears throat> um, so overall, uh, I, yeah, I, I, the land use is fine. Uh, I'm fine with the zoning, the changes in zoning. The density, I know with the 2006 PUD, the density is a little bit less, but obviously this... Uh, I assume that obviously the increase in density, it's not horrible, but it's economic and, you know, that increase is, is economic in nature or the reason for it. Um, site layout, access, I know there were quite a few staff uh, comments under the fire department mentioned that they suggested another exit on the townhome side. And again, I know this is a concept plan, but um, that's something, I mean, I'm looking at that too, it looks like there's only one, they'd be, you'd be kind of stuck there. Uh, if some some issue uh, there was a sort of a choke point or what have you at the entrance, so I understand that um, park district. I appreciate the, the the comments regarding more parkland, so that's good as well. Regarding the 
moving forward, I and I do agree with Alderman Orball as well. If there's, you mentioned you're talking to the county regarding instead of fee in lieu of perhaps some units, is that right? I know Ellen and Russ, we talked about our policy being one to push more for units. So I would, again, we're at the beginning stages here. I would encourage you to continue to have those conversations because I would like to <coughs> explore that option of a senior uh, you know, building perhaps um, rather than the fee in lieu of. But, um, and then moving forward too, I would prefer, a, you mentioned Ellen as a PUD, maybe like split it off from the, the current PUD just um, because of the staff comments and deviations, I think that's probably the best um, approach so we can discuss. But that's kind of my high level comment, so. Okay, uh, I'll proceed again. <coughs> Great. No, yeah. Thank you both no. for your presentation. I, I like the concept oh. too. Go ahead. No. Um, just the, the idea of affordable or senior housing to somehow work that in if it's possible based on what we have there. Um, your comment earlier about the amenities <coughs> to the east so that people could get access to that. Um, I think that would be a, a great thing to look at if it's possible to do that with the layout as it stands. Uh, something that I know we all as a community are looking to make sure we include those affordable and or senior accessible housing somewhere in all our developments as they come down the road. But if there's a way to kind of work that in as you go through the concept and fine tune the uh, presentation, but other than that, I, I agree with it and I think it's great. All my other questions have been asked previously, so awesome. I'm good. Thank you. All the person on. Thank you. Yes, thank you for your presentation. I don't want to repeat too much of what I've heard down here. A lot of it is mm -hmm. things that I agree with. Um, I do want to reiterate two points. Um, one that Alderman Petrella said about the, uh, the access. I am concerned about the single point, or what, what feels like a single point of uh, egress and ingress on 38. It would be would make me a little bit more comfortable to have more points of, of entry and exit. Um, actually, I guess there's three points. Uh, another would be, you mentioned that you are work, trying to work with Meyer regarding um, some accessibility uh, on foot as far as getting, getting to the, the store or that area of the, um, of the shopping center. Um, outside of vehicles, and I, I do understand that people do try and get the path of least resistance, which is great when you are an able-bodied person or you have the ability to do that in maybe good weather without snow, et cetera, but I would like to see if there's a possibility to have some intentional paths created so that we have something that is safe, accessible, um, intentionally passed for people so that that can be the encouraged way for them to get to and from somewhere so that they don't have to feel like they are reliant upon um, maybe something that might not be as safe uh, or, or just unable to utilize that because it's not, it's not a safe passage for them um, or ADA compliant. Um, and then, you know, third, I think I have to echo the, the request for uh, some sort of affordable housing. I wouldn't want to push for specifically and only um, that for uh, retirees or for the elderly, but for any type of affordable or attainable housing. Um, this is a, a segment of our, um, of our community where we have access to transportation, a lot of commerce, a lot of business. It really is the ideal location for attainable housing, um, and it would be sort of a misstep from a planning and development uh, opportunity if we weren't asking for something like that in this quadrant. So I think I would have to ask for something like that to be incorporated. <coughs> thank you. Thank you. So I thank you. Um, I agree with uh, every, all the comments have been said about the use um, affordable housing. So just two questions or kind of points. Um, Ellen or Russ, um, in the past we talked a lot about or we've heard a lot about you know rental inventory availability you know as we've looked at other projects because you know the the inventory was so low that we needed developments like this so i'm just curious you know i've been on council now three plus years how how a potential project like this will help complement or how it'll fill you know potentially a need yeah, I think um, St. Charles is not unique in that um, we have a, a shortage of housing ability, of availability. I mean, that's a nationwide trend right now and seen throughout the Chicago suburbs as well. Um, the tracking that we do is typically um, affordable units, and those have been tra trending downward in terms of prices for rents going up. Um, so um, in terms of getting our overall housing stack up, this would, with, this would help that, but without... Um, 
also including an affordable component, and that would kind of continue to shift our overall share of affordable units down. Okay. Um, thanks. That's perfect. Uh, and then just secondly, so long-term ownership for the rental side, does Lennar maintain ownership? Is that part of the strategic plan? Is there kind of a, you know, we hang on to a project like this for X amount of time? So just a little bit, you know, 10, 20 years down the line, who's, Who's maintaining and owning the property, the rental side of it? Good question. Um, out of the 10 to 15 projects um, that we have developed in the Chicagoland area, they've all been relatively unique in terms of final ownership structure, and most of it depends on your initial financing. So our financial partners, whoever they may be, will definitely have an opinion. So until those conversations, take place. It's difficult for me to be able to commit to any ownership structure. I can tell you that we've had properties that are held for seven years. We've had properties that were held for three years. We've had properties that were held for 10 years. Um, and it really depends on you get the whole team in the room coming together and trying to figure out what the, what the vision is. And, and we will know that, obviously, before we break ground, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that I can come back to you with. But I, you know, it will probably be a while before I have that answer. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for your presentation. A couple of things I want to echo the affordable housing throughout. I think that's very important. Do you mind going back <clears> to <throat> the slides of who you are uh, marketing this to? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, how much for a townhome again? Four. Four hundred. Okay, and how much for the homes? Yeah, the 400 for the townhomes, right? And the apartment rent is about, depending, 18 to 20 to 23, 2400. Mm -hmm. Okay, some of the okay, some of the people you are marketing to, um, that you have up on there, teachers, firefighters, etc. How confident are you that they can afford your places? Meaning, do you know what the median average salary is of teachers in this area that if they wanted to, that they could afford it so um, moving point, forward? I'm sorry, I didn't mean Yeah, that. just moving forward, I'm, I just kind of look at who you're marketing to and wondering, do you know what the median salary is of those professions? And how did you come up to marketing to those? Just it's very interesting to put in those specific mm -hmm. occupations. Um, so it was originally a target based on salary research and then anticipated rents that would be truly attainable housing. And so um, when we did that study and we determined that we're looking at anywhere from 80 to 120 percent of AMI, um, that's really what sets our rents because our goal is to make it attainable housing, to lease it up, to get it full, to have it be a true asset to St. Charles. So in this particular community, our qualifying household income is 61000 to 111000 The 111000 is an outlier because it's accommodating for 12 three-bedroom units. Um, the reality is uh, there will be singles living in this community, but a lot of it young professionals are mostly couples. Uh, that, that makes up the majority of our communities are um, 30 to 35, 25 to 35 sometimes. Um, and then 55 to 65. And so when we were looking at the site and looking at St. Charles demographics, we actually felt that it was a phenomenal fit because those are the two largest population groups in St. Charles right now. So we felt that, you know, it, our target demographic also maybe the most people that will be looking for housing. Um, we, we really felt that it checked the box of truly attainable housing, not the buzzword that everyone's using right now, but these could be affordable for people that are looking for housing opportunities. Thank you. Yep. All the Thank you. Um, I, I know we've talked about affordable housing, but I'm going to reiterate that that is very important to me, that we have units on site. We have a big project here. We're running out of spaces in St. Charles for projects like this where we can actually have units on site versus cash in lieu. So I definitely want to see uh, units on site. I know you're required to provide 36, so I'm looking at my numbers here. Mm -hmm. 
That's something that I think, in hearing from the council, I think you're getting the hint that it, we need something there for affordable housing. And the other one question was uh, when the alderman, uh, Werball, asked about infrastructure costs. And you said that there, you're working on it. So what does that mean? Like, the question was, are you going to cover the costs? And <laughs> well, I presume. Any impact we have, we have to account for. So IDOT costs, <clears throat> we would, that would be us, right? We right. would account okay. for IDOT costs. I think okay. what Rick was referring to is that none of those numbers are, are, are finalized yet. We know that there will be a bucket of dollars that we'll need to spend with IDOT. Okay. But we know that there's dollars we'll have to spend to bring electrical infrastructure to the site, then to disperse it within the site. Okay. We know there's stormwater okay. dollars. So we're accounting for all of it. So you're going to cover yeah. it. Thank you. Yeah. That's, that's what I wanted to hear. Yeah. And if you look through the thing, you saw a lot of staff comments. If you looked at them, I'm not, some of them brought up about and you know egress and ingress at the site, about what the fire department wants. There's a lot of little things about <laughs> sidewalks and stuff. Are you, you have looked through all those. We've reviewed all the staff comments okay. to date, and it's just as a going back all the way to the first side in terms of, of how we want this process to go. What we'll do is we will combine all the comments that you guys have had tonight, all the comments we got from Planning Commission, from staff, put them all together uh, and respond appropriately. And some things, quite frankly, we will not be able to address. And it's better for us to be super transparent about it and get them out now and have an open conversation about it. Okay. Some things we will. Um, these are all items that have been brought up consistently, both between Planning Commission and staff, and we're already in another iteration of planning this right to start picking this stuff up. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I have one question. Everything else has been asked, but we didn't really get into it. You were talking about the um, land cash and uh, park land. Um, with the units that are in here and the affordability levels, there are definitely going to be some kids, and we're also, I mean, walkability, all that connectivity is important. But uh, what kind of recreational space like park land is going to be on this site? Because I see it's pretty much paved, and I don't see where there is a park. Yeah, it's one of our biggest challenges right now, and it was a consistent theme um, basically from everyone that's given feedback on the, on the proposed plan. We are working through it. We are trying to find an area that is highlighted in the blue circle west of the clubhouse, but off of Route 38. Um, that requires some rework of the road network, and, and there's, we're moving some puzzle pieces around to try and accommodate it. Mm -hmm. But um, the next thing that you will see will incorporate some version of a park and a public network of trails um, okay. that will address those comments. It, this is a great project. Uh, th there were a couple of questions. One other <coughs> question, and I know uh, obviously completely uh, separate from the development just to the south of it, but we have two roads next to each other, and you know, you're using an, an old stub as the emergency uh, uh, um, outlet down there. Um, but am I looking at that right? Like, there's there's no opportunity to connect to to Prairie Wind. Yeah. Um, Maybe you're still talking, who knows? Uh, or probably not. There's like probably a 5 to 10% chance of success there. Okay. <laughs> um, it, it's a great project. Uh, the, really, the only thing that I'd really love to see, and, and it looks like you want to see it as well, is just where do we have some recreational area. But we'll yep. illustrate everything else. That's great. Thanks so much. Yeah. I'm Thank gonna you for your time. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. We appreciate Thank you. you guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, moving on. We are at. Um, 4B, presentation of a concept plan for River 504 Town Hall. Ellen, thank you. <clears throat> okay, a concept plan has been filed by J&B Builders for the remaining vacant parcel in the Brownstone PUD at First and Prairie Street. Um, two years ago, the city reviewed a concept plan for a mixed-use building on this property. The developer is now proposing townhomes, eight units and four buildings facing First Street and no commercial uses proposed. Planning Commission re reviewed the concept um, last month and expressed support for the change in land use. Uh, they provided some comments on building architecture. They also felt that the streetscape, First Street streetscape design should be continued along the property frontage. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Julie Salyers and Brian Bowie from J&B Builders. Come on up. <laughs> Do you have a presentation? Please just state your name for the record. I don't know why it went away. Right here. It was open already. Oh. Sorry. Thank you. 
Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Julie Salyers. It's spelled uh, Salyers is S-A-L-Y-E-R-S. I'm here on behalf of J&B Builders. The address is 2000 West Main Street, St. Charles, Illinois. So as I said, my name is Julie Salyers, and I'm with J&B Builders, and I'm here to present our concept uh, plan for River 504 development at the northeast corner of, oops, let's see if I'm off here. provide a brief background about J&B Builders. We're a local St. Charles business and have over 25 years of experience in the construction industry, working on residential, commercial, and government projects. In 1994, the company was started as a custom home builder, and in 2000, we expanded our focus uh, and began working on the development and construction of commercial office and retail spaces. When the market changed in 2009, we changed as well, and we shifted our company focus to federal government work. Since then, we've completed numerous projects for various federal agencies, and we've held multiple contacts with the Department of Defense for work at various uh, military bases in the Midwest. I'd like to now introduce our concept for the River 504 development. Our site would include four freestanding row house buildings with two units per building. A private courtyard and entrance would be located at the front elevation of each unit along South First Street, and an additional entrance, entrance would be provided at the side elevation of each unit. An individual driveway and two-car garage would be located at the rear elevation, which would be accessed from limestone drive. The green space between the buildings will be utilized for private exterior courtyard spaces for six of the units. We are proposing public parking along South First Street, as well as a sidewalk along, along South First Street and one along Cobblestone Drive. Finally, our concept includes improved landscaping along South First Street and around the perimeter of the site. We did receive some comments from staff and plan commission that we intend to incorporate into a revised site plan. Staff comments included that we construct an off-site sidewalk to connect the existing Prairie Street sidewalk to the Fox River Trail. We anticipate including the sidewalk section as part of the project. Staff also requested a 20-foot minimum driveway length, which we intend to modify our site plan to accommodate that minimum length as well. Finally, staff indicated a six-foot parkway should be provided <clears throat> between Cobblestone Drive and the proposed site sidewalk that runs, that, were, that runs along it. We intend to incorporate that parkway. The plan commission had comments relating to South First Street and the placement of the buildings on the site. Based on their comments, we intend to extend the streetscape similar to Milestone Row rather than providing a standard sidewalk that's shown on the plan. They also commented on the building placement in relationship to South First Street. And I intend to address that comment later after discussing our pros, uh, proposed building architecture. So our building architecture includes four-story buildings with up to 4,500 square feet of finished space per unit. On the ground level, there will be a two-car garage and flex space. The second and third levels will contain various living space, kitchen, bedrooms, and bathrooms. And on the fourth level, another flex space and an exterior rooftop terrace is planned. The building's traditional design will consist primarily of brick with additional architectural detailing. We believe the building architecture will blend and complement the adjacent buildings. Staff, as well as the plan commission, did have a few comments regarding the building elevation. Staff comments was that the upgraded materials and details on the front elevation should also be used on the rear and side elevation. We intend to incorporate that into our design. 
During the plan commission meeting, comments were made regarding the pergolas shown along the front elevation of the building, as well as shifting the buildings closer to First Street. We understand these concerns and intend to address both comments by revising our design. We intend to shift the second, third, and fourth floors towards First Street so that they are stacked over the main level courtyard. That will bring the front elevations of the buildings closer to First Street while still providing a covered courtyard at the front elevation. We think these, cha these changes will enhance the development. Multiple planning objectives factored, sorry, changed, factored into our revised concept plan. We originally proposed a multi-use condominium project for the site. Unfortunately, our original concept was not feasible and we've opted not to pursue it. The cost of construction was higher than anticipated and our planning analysis indicated the price points the units would need to be sold at could not be supported by the market. We looked at various methods to decrease the overall price point, changes to the building materials were considered. However, we felt decreasing the quality of the materials would in turn decrease the overall aesthetic of the building design. Adding units was also contemplated. However, that would negatively increase the bulk of the building and require more parking spaces that couldn't be achieved due to the size of the site. And finally, we looked at phasing the construction to decrease the holding costs. However, this couldn't be achieved due to the building design. Our revised townhouse, townhouse, or townhouse row house concept is a more residential style of construction with wood framing. It has more simplistic mechanical, electric, and plumbing systems, and there's no common space to build. In addition, the project can be phased to decrease holding costs. All of these factors will decrease the overall project cost while still delivering a visually appealing end product. Our new concept also improved on the previously approved brownstone PUD that included two freestanding buildings with five units at each building. This two building configuration, this two building configuration would have resulted in four exterior units and six interior units. Interior units are harder to market and sell, although two additional units were previously approved for the site, we prefer to eliminate all interior units. Also, by limiting the number of buildings to a four building configuration, we can break up the structure mass on the site and provide additional green space between the buildings that can be used for private outdoor living space for six of the units. Finally, our concept provides architectural variety to the area. It has a different configuration from the adjacent properties, but will still blend in due to the traditional building style and materials to complement the milestone one and brownstone development. We're happy to answer any questions you may have. <clears throat> oh, why don't we start at the side? Oh, okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for the um, presentation. I guess one of the big questions I have and <coughs> mentioned here is that our ordinance states that the first floor is supposed to be commercial. And that's something that I, we did, we made that ordinance for a reason, to have, we want a commercial on First Street, not all residential. And that's something that concerns me that we're gonna change that, that you wanna change it. We do, the design will allow for home offices on that first level, that was kind of the concept of having the courtyard out front and the flex space on that first level that a home business potentially could occupy that space. True, but that's not what we consider commercial. Commercial is right. a business. And I mean, we did that for a reason when we, did, when we planned First Street and that's, this is going against basically what we want there for commercial. That's, that I mean, was 2005, I would, I understand. We fully argue that some economic conditions have changed over the last 20 years, and our concern would be having additional vacant units along First Street. True, but we do have Whole Foods opening up in the spring, and I do believe right. that will bring more people down where that would actually justify commercial on the first floor of this project. So that, that's basically my only 
I have with that, and that something that concerns me, and I don't know if I can support it with that. But we'll have conversations. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Wonderful presentation. Looks great. Appreciate it. Thank you. Over to Mark. So, um, I think I think trends change, buying habits change. I, I understand the the concepts when First Street was first developed of having first floor commercial. I think this development is perfect. Um, I like I like a lot about it. Um, I'm okay. Yeah, I'm okay with not having you know commercial on that first floor for a project like this. I don't think that we can totally go away from it. Um, but I, I like this concept a lot. The question I have, um, assuming this body is in support, what is your timeline of, of being able to go? We would uh, like to start the project in spring to summer of next year. Uh, we would anticipate two and a half years to build out the project. And if, so that's great, and if the change was recommended to have first floor commercial, how might that change plan? We would have to go back to the drawing board. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. I have a couple of questions. Um, I, I think maybe let's talk about the, um, the commercial piece first. Um, and maybe, I'm not sure if you would be the people to ask or perhaps staff, but I understand that that first floor is flex space let's say I purchase one of these units and I want to operate a business out of this, an actual true commercial business, how does that exactly work from, from a, an ordinance standpoint or my neighbors maybe don't love that I'm doing that? How does, how does that exactly um, it play could, out on First Street? Since this is in a PUD, it could be defined um, in the PUD ordinance for the project, um, but in general, for residential uses, um, home occupations are permitted in any residential unit, um, and there's standards for home occupations. So, um, limited foot traffic, maybe one employee. Um, so, if there were that sort of use incorporated into these units, um, it would be more of like a, a personal business. So, it could maybe open, you know, like a, a, a consulting firm, but not a boutique. Correct. Yes. Okay. So, it wouldn't to to Alderman Wilkaitis's point, it wouldn't be commerce necessarily. It would be right. Re retail sales wouldn't be allowed. Okay, um, even though it's restaurant on, on our big yeah. commerce row. Okay. <clears throat> um, and then, what is the building height here, and does that meet what our what our standards are? Is it is it in line with the brownstone? Whether yeah, I yeah. didn't see that in the. Mm -hmm. It's uh, approximately 50, 50 feet. feet. Um, you mentioned something about an off-site sidewalk being recommended to you. I'm not sure I followed that on I don't think any of the plans. You said something about that was a recommendation. If you, on the south side of the property along Prairie Street is yeah. an existing sidewalk, we would continue that sidewalk to the east down to the river I to see. connect to the along path. the side of the brownstone. I see. Okay. Thank you. That makes, that makes much more sense. Um, I see. Think, oh, and will all will all of these buildings be built at one time, or will you phase these in as they're purchased, or how exactly will that work? We intend to phase them. So if perhaps you're not getting all of them purchased, it's possible that you could build two and not all of them, or is, is that is that a, a possibility? It may be a possibility. We have had substantial interest in the product. Okay. Oh, and. Something I, maybe I missed it. What is the purchase price on these? Uh, or estimation? Estimating we would be north of 1.5 per unit. Thank you so much. Good. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. I don't have anything to add from what's already been so. um, Just a few. Uh, thank you again for. Um, for this, um, so uh, refresh my memory. You did say that you did agree, you will agree to um, create the recreate the first street land. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, but not just a regular sidewalk. Got Correct. it. Okay. Um, no, I mean I, I I hear what Alderman uh, Sukaitis is saying. I I mean first street. I get it. Forces you know economic forces change, and um, it's not a. Personally, I, I mean, I, I want something to go there, and I 
think that that's great that we'll have we'll have more anchor people anchor downtown to shop at Whole Foods and around along First Street. I ideally would wish to have commercial on the first floor, but I completely understand. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, I'm fine with the obviously it'll be a it'll be an amendment, right? A PUD amendment if we move forward. Okay, so not a, for a full new PUD. Architecture looks nice. What is that called? Is that like that modern farmhouse look, or what is? Uh, do you know what that what, <laughs> what it is? I, I mean, I'm not an architect. So, okay. I mean, yeah, the, I just was curious. Um, now, the, the you mentioned something about the so this this point in the memo. I'm completely perplexed by what the planning commission was comments related to building placement including shifting the buildings closer to First Street to provide a transition between First Street Commercial and the Brownstone. I'm, I, I, my mind is not understand, uh, and what is, is that what you were talking about, the stacking? Thing? Yeah, they okay. did, there were comments that some of, some plan commission members did not like the pergolas, while uh, others yeah, were okay cool. with it, it mm. but, and there were also comments that they wanted the buildings to be closer to the, to the road. With the 10 foot depth of the courtyard, our building would be set back from First Street an additional 10 feet from the property to the then, north. Oh, so if you're standing on the south side of First Street looking north, your building would be farther back than the current, where the bank is and everything? Yeah. yeah, they didn't like that, um. which we took that into consideration and thought it was a good point. And right. that's why we are looking to change our design and pull the second, third, and fourth floors over the courtyard. So they're in line on the so east they're in side? Line. Oh. Yes. I mean, do you, I don't know, I'm trying to visualize that. I guess I'm not, uh, it doesn't, I, it's not bothersome when I visualize that, but are you, do you want to do that? I mean, are you prepared to do that for sure? Or are you yeah, still thinking we, about it? Okay. We actually, with looking over the design, it opens up uh, a back second floor. Mm. Uh, like a patio or something, that, yeah will be a nice feature off of the back of the property. So then this pergola will just become like a, they'll <laughs> become a covered, covered porch. courtyard. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then we, okay. we get a bonus of a covered courtyard, which we think is nice to have an outdoor space that's covered as right. well as deck space that's not. Right. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, again, overall, it looks great. I mean, I'm glad I want something, it's our ward, so we appreciate something going there. Um, and um, you know, bummer if there, there's just no need, no desire for a commercial. I assume that you crunch some numbers, and that's what your rationale is. Uh, Even um, our original design, all we had were four boutique mm -hmm. spots along First Street. That was a total of 3,200 square feet. Right, right. Um, yeah, architecture looks fine. I'm sure these are just. Uh, do you anticipate to look exactly like this, or these again? These are just high-level concepts. So the brick isn't going to be that sort of tan color. It might be more red or something. Right. Yeah. It's okay. All concept, right? Right. Now. But I appreciate the streetscape um, matching because if we're not going to have a commercial, at least we can match the rest right. of the streetscape. So, yeah, I um, everything looks fine to me. So thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I do support the land use for the uh, residential townhouses. Uh, I think they look very nice. Uh, thank you for taking care of the pergolas. I'd like to see something different there than that. So um, the streetscape, I, I think that would look nice to continue, have that continuity along First Street. Um, what are you going to do on cobblestone? Is that going to be a standard sidewalk or is that going to be a streetscape? So we have we have planned a, a standard sidewalk, okay. but we will have the um, the uh, green space in between the curb. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, angled parking, 16 spaces. Um, yeah, I'm I'm good with it. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you very much. Uh, again, as uh, everybody else stated, to a degree, this project does stand out. It does. It is attractive. I believe this will seamlessly. Uh, fit in to the space that's in there. It'll also, you know, complement the, the residential that's around there to some degree. It'll complement, you know, just our riverfront and uh, the commercial aspect. I know that is a question that's typically important. To, I'm not going to hang my head on that one at this point because I believe where this parcel is, it's further and further away from the downtown business district, and you're actually pushing in more on multifamily and the parks. So. Uh, we'll see where that goes in the commercial side of it, but uh, at this point right now, uh, I like it just the way it is. Thank you. 
Um, so I'm, I'm fine with it not having commercial on the, on the first floor. Um, obviously, markets do, do change, um, so they're having a tough time just filling some of the first floor, split, first floor space currently on first, so I'm definitely good with that. Um, in regards to the size of 4,500 square feet in the four floors, are you going to be offering some kind of a elevator at that price point? Yeah. Yes, I would think so. Um, and then you said something about rooftop terrace mm -hmm. as well. Obviously, we can't see that on the concept, but will that be on the back side of it? or? Y yes, so the, the front elevation, the, the roof line, and basically it's a... Um, it only covers, cover. that flex space will only cover about 25 feet back on that footprint. The rest of it would be roof deck for 40 to 45 feet. Gotcha. Yeah. No, I'm definitely in, in support of the uh, of the project. I think the adjustments at the Planning Commission that you said you would make are going to make the uh, the product a very very appetizing product for that for that location. And uh, I can see my wife bothering me to buy one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Looks like a cool project. Uh, I'm I'm excited about those roof decks. The one thing to think about in, in all of this is uh, with the pergolas and things like that is there's going to be a row of like it is doesn't show here there's going to be public parking right there and i can understand you need a buffer from from that public parking space this is a gorgeous project uh you know thank, thank you, thank you so much thank you uh, thank i appreciate you. you presenting to us thank you. thank you thank you all right moving on um we are at uh 4c plan commission <laughs> recommendation to approve a pud amendment regarding rear porches for munhall glen pud Thanks, All right. Um, Munhall Glen is a 50 lot single family subdivision approved as a PUD in 2020. Court Earhart of Earhart Construction is requesting to amend the PUD regarding um, porches in the rear yard. Proposed is to allow open and enclosed porches to encroach up to 10 feet into the rear yard setback. Currently, open porches can encroach 8 feet. Enclo enclosed porches, like screened porches, cannot encroach the rear setback at all. Plan Commission held a public hearing on October 22nd and recommended approval with the condition that for lots backing up to Adams Avenue to the south, um, porches can only increase eight feet into the rear. Um, this would be for lots five to 20 along the south end. Um, 10 feet would be allowed for the remaining lots. Um, the condition for the lesser encroachment for the southern lots was in response to comments submitted from neighboring property owners to the south. Um, Court Earhart is here tonight, and I'd be happy to answer questions as well. Awesome. Yeah, there's uh, a couple that I have here. Um, I'm a little concerned why originally they didn't come up with the 10 feet in their original proposal and why they're coming back now for that. Um, that's a little concerning to me um, because uh, I don't know if I want to set a precedent with other places to come back as well. But that's just a little concerning. I guess when I look at that and I've talked to my residents about it, a lot of them were the ones living on Adams Avenue that had the concerns um, with the, the, the 10 foot uh, encroachment with the screened in porches. When I talked to them, a lot of them were not comfortable with that. They liked that the plan commission came back and said eight feet, but they still were not comfortable with the enclosed porches with lots five through 20 even uh, with the eight feet. So I'm wondering if there's a compromise that could be made with lots five through 20, they could still have the unenclosed patios and then everywhere else can have the enclosed uh, 10 feet with the screened in porches. Um, if that's a compromise they're willing to make, I'd be willing to support. If they're not willing to make that compromise, I will not. Okay, would you like to hear from court? Sure. Yeah, the applicant would like to speak to that. <clears throat> Could you state your name for the record, please? Uh, Court Earhart Construction. I'm not with the St. Charles Civics class over there. <laughs> I'm realizing I'm turning into an old guy and sitting there. So anyway, thanks for making me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> okay, my age. Um, it's only been about 40 years. So. Um, the reason that we came back is that we've had a number of sales in there and we're about half built out and we've had a number of people want screened in porches and um, completely transparent. Um, I didn't think of a screen porch as an enclosed porch. I thought of a screen porch as a open porch and so the eight feet um, encroachment um, that was originally part of the development in the rear um, 
I thought it was fine. Um, absolutely a miss on my part. Didn't read it clearly. That's my fault. Um, but uh, I thought it was a good solution. Um, a porch has a roof on it um, and a rear in the eight foot to put some screens on it I don't think is necessarily as impactful. We did also have one person from the neighborhood come and they actually spoke in favor of the uh, amendment um, and so we did have positive uh, feedback on that. Yeah, I, and I know they spoke. I also received five emails on the contrary along with five phone calls. So, and a lot of them were the express people who live on Adams Avenue. No, and, I, and, I, and, and, and that's why I'm wondering if there is a compromise that can be made here with last five through 20, you know, having up to the eight feet, like, like's being said, and everywhere else in the community going to 10 and having the enclosed porch. I'm wondering if that's a fair compromise we can make here. Um, I thought going to the screen porch at eight foot was actually a fair compromise in that situation. I know that 110 letters were sent out and we did receive six or seven, I think one came in that day and one was yours, um, email. And so I think three of them back to the neighborhood. But again, one person who, the person who did show up spoke favorably of it. And so again, a screen porch, you've got a roof over it. Um, and so screens, I don't think, are that impactful. And so I'd like to leave it with what um, we did with the 8-foot on lots 5 through 20 and then uh, go to the 10-foot on the other lots. And, again, I apologize that I didn't have this uh, in place when I originally came through um, two and a half years ago. Three, no, four years ago now. Jeez. Okay. Uh, go ahead. I'll first Alderman, um, to Alderman Folks' point um, in regards to a um, compromise, I'm trying to get a visual of the, the lots on Adams that he's referring to. Are these porches, are they like elevated? Well, it, they, come, they're, 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 they come out the first floor. So in essence, if you think about a deck, I actually, I don't know if the, um, if the pictures from the previous, uh, the public hearing would be available where I could show them some of the pictures of what a unenclosed porch looks like. Okay. Um, basically, there's a, there's a roof covering it, um, and it's like if you think about a deck with, with a roof, just like a front porch. Um, so is it, is it elevated, though? Like, are the, are the people's concerns that they could see into their backyards and the, the porch is at that close or no? No, no the, por no. the porch is at ground level. The porch, the porch is at the, the first floor level, so you'd walk out from the first floor of the home directly into that. We're not talking about, like, a second-story porch okay. or something like that or a walk out terrace or anything like that. Is there, is there a fence on that lot line right now? Uh, we don't have a... Uh, Individuals can put fences uh, along the rear if they want to. As part of our original development, we created a landscape, e a five-foot landscape easement, and we're planting. We've planted trees there along that, and some people have chosen to put some uh, evergreens, some arms or junipers, those type of things, in there to create a little bit more definition. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All the persons for time. Thank you. Um, and look at it, who's there first? I think though that, that's an established neighborhood there, and I believe that these people have concerns about, at least as aldermen in our ward, we need to take care of them. And I mean, I wish we could compromise, but since I mean, it's not going to doesn't matter if it's going to happen. I I can't support this amendment. To well, it. I I think we we also <clears throat> need to remember that we actually downzone this from M2 which was an industrial warehouse that could be 60 feet tall on this property and we downed zone to residential and so we did go with less impact with that i understand that bill and they, they accepted that but i guess now to go to a point where you know what this is something that we were not we were not it wasn't in the original plan so therefore i'm going to support the residents there with my with my vote. Mm -hmm. uh, there, do I have other comments? Go ahead. All the do you by chance know how much footage there is between the back of the homes on Adams <coughs> versus the back of uh, what could be the eight? There, 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 but um, screen porch. We're RS4P. We are an RS4PUD. There are RS4. 
Um, rear yard setbacks are set at 30 feet. Um, there's, there are how, just like our houses are anywhere from 30 to 40 feet. Our lots are actually a little deeper. Our lots are 119 feet. I think those lots are about 106, 103 to 106 feet deep. So the depth is give or take. I did not go out and specifically measure. I sure. looked at some. I looked at some aerials and pulled some um, from the county zoning maps. I pulled some measurements off of that, and so they're in the 30 to 40 range. And there's a variety of things also in that goes. And then, do you think it was an aesthetic issue? Is that what you're hearing, or? In regards to the porches existing. Oh, and just some people wanted that screen porches. They just wanted screen porches, and there's some situations where if they put a screen porch, it went into the rear yard setback, and we're allowed to do an unenclosed porch eight feet into the rear yard setback. But if you put a screen on it, it's considered an enclosed porch, and so you can't do an enclosed porch. Um, and so that's what I was hoping to rectify with this. Right, but does anybody from the Homes by Adams are they claiming it's an aesthetic issue? To see a porch, visibly see it, I, I, I guess, Mark, you might be um, There was, in, in, the letters of, in the letters of opposition, I think, there, again, I think there were three of them who backed to it. I think people were concerned about noise in the backyard. I think people, um, that seemed to be what they were, they were concerned with, which isn't going to change, I guess, whether a patio or a screen porch. Okay, thank you. The, the, the lots in question on the, on the Adams, the 5 through 20, how many of those are currently sold or built or under construction? Like, where are they at? Um, we have three lots left on that row, lot 17, 18, and 20. Lot 19 is currently being built. Um, and lot 17, 18, and 20 are vacant. Gotcha. Do you, do you think that? It, and I'm gonna I'm gonna side with the aldermen that mm -hmm. are in charge of that that yeah. ward as a mm -hmm. you know from a, just a professional courtesy. Um, but I'm just trying to understand what Mr. Folks was saying. A compromise. What what were your thoughts? I had mentioned. A fence. I didn't understand. He had. I had mentioned a fence. Is that something that? I don't, I, visually, I, I'm trying to picture this. I'm having a tough time, so I'm looking for you guys to kind of uh, feel a little bit. You know, in terms of a fence, that'd have to be something I'd take back to them and ask as a possibility. I know noise was a big issue that they were concerned about with, with having them in a little bit of the aesthetic as well. So that's why I was Mark, thinking the compromise. Real quick to be clear, like if you, if, if what you were suggesting would affect, because right now what Planning Commission recommended was eight feet, but you could still do enclosed. And you're just saying no changes, which would only affect three unbuilt lots. And that would be the only compromise that would be the difference in your vote. Well, or, because the rest of them are built. Correct. Okay. Unless they're, I, I, look, I, I, unless they're looking to add a yeah. screened in enclosed porch now, then no. But that wouldn't be part of your work if it's already sold, correct? So what you're saying is the eight the eight feet that somebody could do, they can still just do an unenclosed porch. An unenclosed. But, yeah. And we couldn't just do a screen. You just don't want anything there. No. And it would affect two unbuilt lots, or three unbuilt lots, as you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, I would, I thought it was reasonable on the eight foot since we already have it, and it just goes to a screen. Um, you guys have to t you guys have to tell me. I'm quite I'm disappointed. I think it would be nice. I, I think a couple of people might do a screen porch, um, and so you know it's just well just just, just, just to help this conversation too. Cause yeah. If, if you're not good with this, we're gonna we're gonna be looking at a proposal that asks for all of it. And right now that there's some things, and I just I, I want to mm -hmm. make sure that well, like that's, if so basically what you're doing is you would take out lots five through twenty. Correct. But then you get for everything else. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I just, I, you know, here. Or we could vote on it the way that it's written right now. No, I just, I. Okay, cool. Clearly, I, clearly, I, 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 no, no, you, 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 you've made it extremely clear, and I just, I didn't know what that, if, so no screens, we stay at eight, we stay at the eight foot mm -hmm. with an unenclosed porch mm -hmm. on those, and the rest we go to allow 10 and. And, and you can with the screen or closed. Correct. Mm -hmm. 
Can I make a suggestion if possible? Because I, I, I think visually it's really important to see eight feet, 10 feet, not a big difference. Um, screened in versus open, not a big difference in my mm -hmm. opinion. But like from an aesthetic standpoint, I, I kind of wish I had some better visuals or I'm just gonna have to actually go out to the site to get a better feel for it myself. I would make a suggestion maybe until we gather some more information, um, maybe this is something that we can we can table until next month just to get some more information. Yeah, hang, hang on, let's, let's answer this one and then we can come back. I got a couple. Because I don't want to I don't want to, to go forward with a vote that might end up put you someplace when there's something that was better and accomplishes more of your goals. Yeah. If I can I can show you some pictures of uh, the only reason I'm mentioning that is because alderman folks said no. is there a way to compromise, so I, I want to make sure that we're yeah. respecting that and respecting you at the same time. I think it's important. Well, the person, whoever, that's a, 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 a terrific point. I think it's good government just to work with the applicant to see before we, we end up going down a road that <coughs> gets you less of what you're looking for than might be possible. No, no, I think it's valid. So this is, this, ha this is an unenclosed porch that happens to be on a lookout lot, okay? So that's what, that's what this is. This is an unenclosed porch that happens to be on a lookout lot. Those lots there are not lookout lots. This is a screen porch that um, is much more similar to what would be in that area. This is actually a screen porch that is actually on lot six because it didn't encroach. We kind of, sh we shrank the depth of the porch two feet so it wouldn't encroach. And so it's at 30 feet, but that is actually that's how very similar to what it would look like, and that's what we're, that's what I'm talking about. And so basically, again, this is what an unenclosed porch looks like. Those lots are not lookout lots, okay? So this porch would be at grade. Could you, could you define what a lookout lot is? Sure. So so a lookout lot is you go into your main floor, okay? Uh -huh. You go down into your basement and your basement has windows. So see in, in this picture, see the two windows that are gotcha. just below, that's what we call a lookout, and so that's what those are. And so this is what a, the rear porch looks like, and then this is what the screen porch looks like. Okay. Just so we're clear, that particular porch you're showing is actually Six feet and not the eight feet. If you said you shrank it two feet to be so, so this porch on lot six mm -hmm. meets the thirty-foot rear yard setback because if it was unenclosed, we could actually go eight feet closer. But they wanted a screen porch, and so we kind of we because of the way the lot was and everything, we actually shrank the porch, the screen porch, just a little bit so it met the thirty-foot setback rule. Um, I mean, if, if you guys aren't going to change, which it sounds like you're not going to change your view, um, again, I don't think the screen porch is that impactful. We had somebody who came in from the neighborhood who spoke in favor of this, and I know that there was three letters of people who, one was on the edge and two backed, who were opposed. Um, I guess in this situation, I would take what I can get, and you guys serve a lot of Monday nights throughout the year, and I don't want to take up any more of your time. So we got all the first level. So I, I took the liberty of driving out there to take a look at the location, mm -hmm. and and I can understand the residents that have concerns. It it is pretty close to some of those more established homes, so. If you have a screened porch, you have a tendency probably in the summers and evenings to stay outside a little bit longer, I would imagine, with the mosquitoes and things of that nature. And maybe from reading the letters, it sounds more like privacy, noise, um, things like, like that that may be more of a concern for the ones that are closer. Um, so I looked at it. I, I understand the concern. I support what they're, what they're recommending a, a compromise. I think it's fair. I think it's reasonable. I would support that if that's what they want to do. Is there any more discussion with that? Yeah, okay. My, my only concern is for staff. I know that the Zoning Board of Appeals 
has not historically allowed for um, the uh, the exception on the screened in porches, and I guess I'm concerned about making an exception in, in one place and what that does as far as future developments or what impact that might have. So I would um, distinguish this application from a, a variance application that the zoning board would hear in that it's being requested for an entire, entire project uh, through a PUD approval. So there's different findings that need to be met. Um, so in theory, this, um, as Court was saying, this, this request perhaps could have been included as part of the original request for the project. Um, it's, it's reviewed in the context of findings for a, a PUD, um, which are different than trying to prove a hardship for an individual lot where the request is specific to one property um, and the conditions of that property. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no, seeing no more discussion, I would be looking for a motion. Otherwise, we can, we can uh, make a decision on the motion that's here, or a motion could be made with an adjustment that, that, that gives the builder that compromise if you want to propose yeah. a compromise. I'd like to propose that. Okay, yeah. so, so the motion would be to approve uh, what's presented with um, the lots 5 through 20 uh, allowing 8 foot and no enclosed porch. Is that correct? Is correct. Is that the motion you're making? Correct. Okay, well, we have a motion from second. Folks, and a second from uh, uh, Alderperson Wormel. Um, thank you. Please call the roll. Bessner? Yes. Weber? Yes. Sulkaitis? Yes. Folk? Yes. Bungard? Yes. Munz? Yes. Kim? Yes. Petrilla? Yes. Werbel? Yes. That motion passes. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I appreciate the discussion. Thank you. Reasonable people can disagree. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we are now uh, moving on to um, recommendation regarding the St. Charles Housing Trust Fund allocation to Kane County Affordable Housing Fund for Carroll Tower. Thank you. Um, so Carroll Tower is an affordable senior apartment building with 108 one-bedroom apartments located in downtown. It was built in 1984. Tenants must be income qualified to live there. They have to be um, at 30 to 60 percent of the area median income. The building is under a HUD project-based Section 8 housing assistance payment contract called a HAP contract. Um, so based on this, tenants pay 30% of their income towards rent, and then the re remaining portion of the rent is subsidized by HUD. Um, Carroll Tower was purchased by Three Diamond Development LLC in 2022 with the intention of renovating the building and continuing to operate as affordable senior housing. Three Diamond manages over 20 affordable housing developments and has been a developer owner and operator of affordable housing since 2008. A new HAP contract is expected to be approved between Three Diamond and HUD, um, which would then enact a new 20-year affordability period. Um, Three Diamond has applied for Kane County, Housing, Kane County Affordable Housing Fund financing to assist in the cost of renovation. The request is for $1.1 million to be put towards the $42 million project. Uh, about 558,000 would come from Kane County, and about 545,000 would come from the city's housing trust fund. Um, Kane County staff have report, re prepared a detailed report um, reviewing the application. Uh, the developer, development pro forma and supporting documentation were, were reviewed and accepted by county staff as part of their review. The Kane Elgin Home Commission, which reviews these funding requests through the county um, recommended approval of the county's portion of the funding in October. Um, so to provide kind of some background information on the process for review and approval of city funding, back in 2018, the, the city council allocated a portion of our housing trust fund to the Kane County Affordable Housing Fund to be made available to developers of affordable housing, along with funds the county receives from federal sources. Um, typically, our Housing Commission approves the city's end of funding for projects. However, there is only $147,000 left from the city's initial allocation of trust fund dollars. So, City Council now can increase the city's housing trust fund allocation by um, the remainder, $398,000, to cover that funding gap for Carroll Tower. So, this would come to a total city contribution of $544,881. 
Um, the funding would be in the form of a 0% interest loan with a 30-year payback period. So we would get our funds back. Um, the housing trust fund would then have a remaining balance of $1.7 million. Um, housing Commission discussed the request um, at their meeting last month. They voted unanimously to approve the request subject to council approval of the additional housing trust fund allocation. Um, commissioners expressed support for the project, recognizing the importance of preserving and supporting the city's existing affordable housing stock. They felt it would be a productive use of the housing trust fund and still leaves a healthy balance for future projects. Uh, we do have a representative from Three Diamond here tonight if there are questions for the owner, and I can take questions as well. Okay. Uh, person wants to know. I do have some questions. Um, so I'm very supportive of the affordable housing component. Um, the subsidized housing is fantastic for the, the residents that are there. My concern is the, um, the property manager that this developer is utilizing. After some research, um, it seems as if this particular property manager is is very different from who is currently managing that property. If you go online right now, you can see exactly who that property manager is. The picture of the current property manager is right there on the website. You can probably go knock on his door if you have a problem with them. Um, they manage about five properties. The new or the proposed new property manager manages 70 uh, all over the country. If you go and look at some of their reviews on Glassdoor, um, LinkedIn, um, different, um, you know, Google, all of those places, um, they have some pretty not so great reviews. And most of those are the employees are not treated well, they are not, um, they're not resourced well, not trained well. And I'm concerned since we have a vulnerable population, um, both economically and age wise, that have a standard of living already, that have a, an expectation in a place that they already live and we're transitioning them to a new property manager with funds from our city. I understand that the county is a, has a larger footprint, a larger uh, thing that they touch. These are our residents and it's our housing fund. I'm concerned that our money might be going into paying for property management or partially paying for property management that might not be at the standard that would give the quality care for these residents and that they are not local in the way that the current um, management company is, where they come into town, they are, they are you know, shopping in our stores, eating in our restaurants. Um, so I, I have a number of concerns in that area, and I, I don't know if, if you can speak to that, if the, if the new owners can speak to that, and, and what kind of benchmarks we can ask for in their contract with this property manager to ensure that this population has that, that quality of care um, that's not something that I can speak to, but I can turn it over. Please just state your name for the record. Hi, good evening. Ben Porish, uh, 2950 West Jarlith Street in Chicago. Thank you. Thank you yeah. So uh, first off, I'm happy to be here and excited about uh, being able to move forward with, uh, with this uh, big project for us um, and for the community. Um, regarding the property management, um, so the, it's actually the management that's in place now and has been, it has been in place since we acquired the property a couple of years ago um, with the same on-site manager. Mm -hmm. So she's been in place, um, and she was with the previous owner and she stayed on uh, when we acquired the property and then she was then hired by Ludwig & Company who is the current management company. Okay. Uh, Ludwig & Company is actually an Illinois-based business. Um, we have, I think, five different um, Developments, senior developments that they manage for us already, okay. and they're very, very experienced with this particular population. And I think their their uh, offices are in, are in uh, Gurney. Yeah. So they are, you know, they're not they're, they do manage properties throughout the Midwest, but they are based here in Illinois. And the you know, for from a continuity standpoint, we felt it was very, very important to keep the manager, who, the site manager, who is in, who was there previously in place. So there's been no change in management from previous ownership, and, and that is going to continue on. So that answers your question. And the, but will they, will, will they continue to resource the other staff in the same manner? Absolutely. That's my concern, and, and, and address any, any concerns that come up 
as those things come up, are those things that are built into your contract with, with that supplier? Like Absolutely. in the business that I work in, we have we require all of our suppliers to meet our standards and follow our, you know, adhere to our <clears throat> policies. Is that something that you have built into your contracts where the, the you know, these residents are going to have recourse if they're not happy with this, this property manager. Absolutely. And, and even a step beyond that, even and we obviously have our own contract with them, but they have to be approved by both the state of Illinois and by HUD as, you know, for, for this particular population. So that's all in place. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. All the business okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, this is maybe for staff. Uh, okay. It was a 30-year loan but it's paid monthly, yearly, correct? They pay off the balance? Um, the payback, payback does not begin um, at, a, at a defined year, from my understanding. It depends on the cash flow, but at the end of the 30 years, we will have to be paid back in so, full. So they have a balloon payment in, after 30 years? They might. Okay. Well, yet I'm looking at one of the statements here from the county. It says proposed affor affordability period. So it's 15 years, right? That, so, uh, so different funding sources for this project have different affordability periods. Right. So um, like the HAP contract with HUD has a 20-year period. Um, so that is the period of affordability attached to that funding, the subsidized rent portion. And then um, the county's affordability period is 15 years. I believe they're also getting IDA funding that has um, 20 to 30-year period. So I think that the, um, in terms of like how long they are um, required to be affordable, kind of depends, you know, if there's still that outstanding funding source that hasn't been paid back, then they're still subject to that affordability okay. period. For, for our 30-year one then, what happens if they decide in 15, 20, whatever the numbers yeah, are? The, the uh, petitioners behind you. And, uh, yeah, will help you. Well, yeah, this will be affordable for, thir uh, for a minimum of 30 years based on the, the Low income housing tax credits from the state. Is that in writing somewhere? Because I'm, yeah, just, reading, I'm just reading what it says here, and it doesn't say 30 years. At least I couldn't find it here. Yeah, that's that's part of the the program. So it'll be the, that the whole Carroll Towers will be afford for 30 years. Yes, a minimum of 30 years. Minimum. Of 30, okay, that's my question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, actually, all the person work. Um, yeah, thank you for your presentation. Right. It's important, obviously, for us to retain our current affordable housing for seniors, so I'm, I'm glad you're reinvesting in the building. Um, so uh, my question, th thank you about the, the, the questions that my colleague Jamie Munns asked about management. So, so the current management that's there is going to stay there? That's, that's, the, that's the objective is to keep right. them there? Okay. Um, and then... Uh, my next question is the completion of the project, the, re the renovation of the building, it, it looks like it's going to end in 2026, is that correct? Correct. So is that when the new contract kicks in, when it ends, or does it start in 24 now? How Which does that the, the HAP contract? Yeah. That will be in place at the, close fin the closing of all the financing, which is in the next month or so. Okay, okay. Yeah, right. and, but that's already been approved by HUD. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Appreciate it. <clears throat> this is just background for me. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what's included in the forty-two million dollars uh, worth of renovations for yeah, Carroll Towers? So, uh, first off, there's going to be you know new appliances. We're, we're, the, the units are going to be going to be uh, basically gutted. Mm -hmm. New flooring, new kitchen appliances, in-unit uh, washer and dryer. Uh, mechanical systems. I mean, that's, it's it's a it's a very substantial, you know, uh, renovation. And and the idea, back to the 30-year affordability uh, through the loan and housing tax credits, is to put the property in a position to be um, sustainable for a, for an extended period of time. So that's I mean, it's a very very extensive rehab. Mm -hmm. I, and I don't I might have missed it and may not be in there. Carroll Tower was purchased in 2022. Um, what was the purchase price? Uh, $23.5 million. Okay. Uh, I have a question. <clears throat> yeah. um, so uh, buying it and then doing a, a substantial renovation, is that going to, I mean, within affordability, is that going to change any of the price component of the unit? No. Nope. 
Not at all. Why, why did, uh, and you said this is going to, like, making this investment now will help you keep them affordable in the long term. Was, was this a distressed property at all, or was it just dated? You know, because um, this, is, this is a population we all care about, like, some of, you know, I mean, all of our aunts' parents, mm -hmm. I mean, some of the, our most loved residents of St. Charles have spent time or are in Carroll Tower. So I'd love to hear more about that. And no. I appreciate that you guys are doing it the way you do it. This presentation is terrific, Thank in you. my opinion. Thank you. Um, so the, the, the rent and the cost to the, to the tenants are not affected at all. The rents are set by HUD. Okay. And, and we had to, you know, when we made our presentation to HUD, we presented to them market research to justify the rents that were needed for the property. And then HUD approves those in that half contract. And then it doesn't change, you know, the, the residents still only pay 30% of their, of their rent. So even though the rents go up a little bit, their rents go up a minute amount. Okay. Sorry, okay. Chairman Lencioni, I did have a question. Um, in regards to the, um, when you start to do the project, it, it's going to be, sounds like it's going to be pretty intense at that spend. It's like, call it at 108 units. It's like 400,000 a unit. The residents, when they're getting work done on their units, how does that, Flow for the residents. So just, just to be, it's a good question. And, and you know, part of that of the um, that 42 million is also there's acquisition money involved in that. It's about eight million between eight and nine million of construction. So I think it's about 92 thousand a unit or so is where we're at. Um, and it's in place rehab. So the the, the residents are only going to have to move one time. We we've actually held back units and kept some units vacant so that way we can start construction only in vacant units and then move residents that way they only have to nobody's being moved off site nobody's being displaced from the property mm -hmm. moved from a uh, their their current unit to a renovated unit okay great thank you very much i'm definitely in support of the project i know how hard it is from being on the county board before i know how hard it is to find projects that meet all of the criteria to qualify for these funds so i'm fully in support of this and thank you very much thank you second uh, motion by Bonger, did we get a second by Kim? Uh, please call the roll. Bessner? Yes. Weber? Yes. Sokaitis? Yes. Folk? Yes. Bungard? Yes. Munns? Yes. Gem? Yes. Petrilla? Yes. Werbaum? Yes. That passes. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to um, uh, 4E recommendation to approve a sales tax agreement with GFI Piazza LLC. Oh, shoot, you know what I'm saying? It was the other one. I'll show you. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, this is a recommendation to approve a sales tax sharing agreement with GSI Piazza LLC. Uh, this is a project that I think uh, City Council uh, is well aware of as it went through concept uh, last year. Uh, last year with favorable uh, recommendation and then over the summer it went through our entitlement process. Uh, Jim, is there a way to get the top off? Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, this is a, a piece of property um, that is adjacent to Charlestown Mall, um, just to the west, and then it is also just south of the east side Jewel Osco. Uh, this is approximately 7.5 acres. Uh, it is vacant right now. In fact, uh, to the best of my knowledge, this is a piece of property that has never been developed on. Uh, the proposed project that we, we call Foxhaven Square is about 70,000 square feet of commercial space. 
uh, four different buildings, and then the, it doesn't actually include the Jewel Osco, but it is important as the developer has, has purchased that property as well. It's not really part of the development, but there is some interaction with that. Uh, the total project cost is uh, $22.2 million, and uh, these are some renderings that we've seen before. Uh, you can see them on the screen now. Uh, the developer is GSI. Um, you know, we, we call them the Greco family. This is a family that a lot of their members live here in town are well invested. Uh, they are also part of the Greco de Rosa Investment Group, uh, which is responsible for the pheasant run industrial project that we have ongoing right now. Uh, and they are previous owners of uh, Greco and Sons, uh, which is a food uh, distribution company, uh, which is very important for this project as a large portion of this project is uh, restaurants. And of course, when you're in a, a food distribution uh, company, uh, your biggest clients, of course, is restaurants. Uh, so uh, with those relationships that they, relationships that they've had, um, they have been able to attract a lot of these uh, really honestly premium restaurants uh, to uh, St. Charles to be part of this development. Uh, some of these we do know, these are all just the committed tenants. Uh, Hampton Social, uh, this is, uh, uh, I believe they call it a coastal cuisine, uh, mm -hmm. is what they go for. They have four locations around Chicagoland. The closest one is in Barrington, uh, which is very nice. And this is a new concept for them. Uh, they are including the, the pickleball uh, facility uh, inside their 20,000 square foot uh, facility. And I think they're going to also have a couple other uh, activities in there, bocce ball maybe, and then also some like golf simulators, fun things like that. Uh, another one of the committed tenants is Fire and Wine. Uh, this is also some them, someone that we're familiar with. Uh, it's, it's the same restaurateur as Giamia. Uh, and they will be part of this development, and this is also an, uh, an Italian uh, concept. Taco Mucho, which is a Mexican concept. Simple EJ's, which is currently has a location in Chicago, and it's kind of like a, a sports bar themed. Full of Beans, which is uh, a coffee, uh, a specialty coffee shop. Mm. And then Greco de Rosa Investment Group, they'll be including their development office uh, in this development as well. I know that they're actively talking with many other tenants to include uh, in here, and once they get uh, to work on the site, I think they'll have a lot more activity. They're already in a lot of concepts. Uh, some of the photos up here you see at the top, that's Hampton Social. Uh, Taco Mucho is in the bottom left, and on the, on the, on the bottom right is Fire and Wine. Uh, getting into the, the tax inc uh, implications for this project, uh, of course, sales tax here in St. Charles is 2.5%. Uh, if they were fully occupied in the first year, they would expect $775,000 worth of sales tax. Over a 10-year period, that would be over a, a touch over $10 million. Uh, I'll be honest, this is extremely aggressive. Uh, this would be at the very, very top uh, echelon of, of what our restaurants produce right now. So um, it is a little bit ambitious in, in my opinion, but of course, given their background, uh, they're well informed about uh, these restaurants and how much they can produce. Uh, property taxes, uh, currently the city, the city, just the city collects about $5,000 in property taxes, not very much, this is vacant land. Uh, estimated, uh, whenever this project is complete, it's about $490,000 is what I'm estimating total in property taxes. The city portion would be about $40,000. Uh, I don't quite have enough uh, <clears throat> information right now to calculate this, but of course a lot of these restaurants would also be serving alcohol, and there would be, there is a 3% uh, tax on all alcoholic beverages that would apply. As far as employment goes, uh, they're estimating 300 to 400 do jobs, depending on the restaurants uh, or the businesses that they're able to attract at the end of this, and that's something that I think is reasonable. Uh, those are not uh, full-time jobs, though, of course, those, some of those would be part-time. Getting to the redevelopment agreement, uh, when uh, the Greco family first reached out to us in, in talking about the site, uh, one of the things that the city uh, indicated that they would want to see is a connection to Charlestown Mall. Uh, this is not something that will necessarily benefit their development, at least today and until there's a bigger development plan for Charlestown Mall, uh, but it is something that the city wants to plan for in the future. Uh, but again, for Fox Haven Square, they actually already have access off of Route 64, uh, off of Kirk, and then also uh, additionally from Foxfield Drive. So a fourth access to this property really isn't quite necessary for them, but um, they are willing to put in 
uh, this cross access to Charlestown Mall, uh, which is estimated to be 425,000, uh, but that will get into the sales tax rebate portion. Uh, additionally, one thing that did come up is, is, is city staff is now starting to put a little bit more stress on it to developers to say that we want sidewalks expanded uh, when the new developments go in. Uh, the developer is not required to, to, or by code, they are not required to put in all the uh, sidewalks that they are uh, putting into the plan. So, for example, they bought the Jewel Osco property. They are not required to put in the sidewalk just because you buy a property doesn't mean you need to put in the, 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 the sidewalk by code, but they are willing to do so, and, and to be honest, it will benefit uh, their, their business as well. Uh, that is estimated to be $326,000. Uh, for the sales tax rebate, uh, what it contemplates is a 100% rebate for the cross access to Charlestown Mall, and then 50% rebate for the sidewalk expansion, and that does kind of go in line with our 50-50 our uh, sidewalk gap program that we have. It doesn't directly apply, but that was kind of the rationale behind it. Uh, that would make the maximum rebate at $588,000. Uh, that would be the maximum. Um, we, they, they are required to submit the cost of what these are, and if it comes in less, then the maximum rebate would be less. Uh, also important to note, uh, last year we did increase our sales tax rate 0.5%. Uh, moving forward with redevelopment agreements, in, including this one, uh, we will not be negotiating over that 0.5% increase. Uh, this is what we did for the Whole Foods as well. Uh, that is something that is money that will go, continue to go to the city and go towards infrastructure. Uh, so what's left of that, given that the city is going to keep that percentage, 50% uh, of the remaining amount would be rebated back to the developer. Uh, what does this mean in intangible terms? On the right-hand side there, I kind of have uh, a breakdown. Uh, if uh, the development was to hit their sales tax goal, uh, the developer share would be 310000 in the first year, uh, which would be about 40% of the total uh, sales tax, and then the city share would be 465000 or about 60% of the total sales tax. Uh, the first year, I am kind of anticipating that they're not not all the spaces are, are going to be occupied, so this is kind of the best picture, but uh, the percentages there should remain the same. Uh, the term of this agreement is seven years. They have seven years to get to their maximum rebate amount. Uh, however, based off of the projections, uh, we would estimate that the rebate to be uh, given out um, in three to four years. <clears throat> the maximum rebate percentage, so um, what I'm referring to here is how much is the rebate actually paying for uh, the total uh, project cost. So again, the total project cost was a little over two, $22 million or was about $22 million, uh, and this re the maximum rebate amount is 588 So that's 2.65%. Uh, that's a relatively small amount for, for all incentives that are given out in the city of St. Charles or in other communities, to be honest. Uh, for compar comparison, the, the Kia sales tax sharing uh, that we did, agreement that we did a uh, year and a half ago, that was 24%. So that's kind of the extreme of what is what is really high and honestly what, what car dealers typically get, and this would be on the very, very low end of that percentage. Uh, Greco Dorosa did, or Dorosa did, uh, sorry, uh, the Greco family uh, did also submit a pro forma uh, that we uh, were able to look at, um, and I kind of broke this down in as simplest terms as possible. Uh, there's 70,000 square feet of leasable space out there. Uh, what I projected a reasonable rent to be was $25 uh, square foot, uh, and that is what uh, the, the Greco family has indicated is, is about what they're going for depending on the tenant space, uh, which brings the total revenue uh, up to $1,750,000, uh, which sounds like a lot uh, until you compare it to the total project cost. So getting to what the ROI is of uh, of, the, of the project or what the percentage is. Um, it's simply just a division there. Uh, the, the total revenue for, for the purposes of this calculation, um, it is the net operating income. If you're in real estate, these are triple net uh, leases. So uh, those are essentially equal at this point because the tenants will be incurring a lot of those costs. Uh, but it's at 7.8% before any, uh, any type of incentive. Uh, typically, when I talk to developers, they are looking for a minimum of 8% 8, 8%, uh, return. 
uh, all the way up to 12. Uh, so when you do include uh, the sales tax rebate, it does put the re return on investment up to 8.21%. Uh, 8 and with that, that concludes my uh, presentation. The only thing that I'll add on is that uh, I think when I got here two and a half years ago, uh, I heard a lot about uh, the east side wanting a lot of, or wanting more interesting projects. They didn't want uh, just everything to be car dealerships and gas stations. And I think this project with all the exciting components to it uh, kind of accomplishes that. Uh Start with all the person bloggers. So we've had a little bit from each of the wards, it feels like tonight. So this is kind of nice to finish with the second ward. Um, I, I'm in complete support of this. I think the the opportunity that this brings and connecting some of the pieces, it, it makes a ton of sense. And I appreciate the aggressiveness of saying, you know, three to four years is where they think it. To, to me, that says the confidence that they have in this project and what it's going to mean. So I'm in total support. Yeah. All the person did you want to go first one? Oh, yeah. sure. Okay. Thank you. It's your board. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I agree with Alderman Bongard. Um, I I appreciate the um, the investment here. I am excited about the development, and I I like that the city is working with them on this incentive. Um, I do have, I have two <coughs> questions I want to ask. Um, one is. I know that this is not tied to that development, but are, is there a way that we can um, address in the public meeting the questions that we get about the crosswalk at that main intersection that this falls near uh, at 64 and Kirk Road? Because I know that that is not the responsibility of this development, but it does intersect there. And while that is a county and a state road, somehow that has become the responsibility of the city to invest in, and I just would like to have something in the public meeting discussed about that, if you can speak so to we that. We won't go too far because it's not a part of this. I, but I so understand, but it's up, very right, important yeah. that this is addressed no, no, here. No, sure. Yeah. So uh, this is something that staff has talked about, and we understand from, from council uh, that there is interest in exploring the possibility of, of putting a crosswalk here. Uh, so it is a long process. This is probably something that's going to take a few years um, and could cost somewhere around a million dollars to do so. Um, we are planning on putting in the budget kind of that, that next step to get the design underway for next year. Uh, we have met with county officials that have indicated that they'd be interested in doing some type of uh, sharing agreement with us because this is partially a county road. So um, that is not something that is a guarantee, but is um, something that's definitely worth pursuing and, and a good to hear from the county. That is good to know. Thank you so much yeah, for that. that. not important, but it's I know. Mm -hmm. I know. And then my other question is, I, I, the one thing I am disappointed on this is, is that because they do also own the parcel with Jewel, I thought that there was going to be something addressed with staff regarding the over parking or the, the, the extra parking that they have since they do have the opportunity to utilize all that parking. And I guess I'm trying to understand why now there is so much parking in this area and they're not able to utilize that space in a, a better way where they could, they could create more even you know usable space for other things yeah i believe they do have a, a little bit more parking than is uh required by code uh this is a little bit complicated because they do have a lot of restaurants and you think right across the street is the cooper's hawk and everyone talks about how many cars park at the cooper's hawk uh, and they are really bringing in some premium restaurants uh, that are going to have a, a pretty large pull um, just this past weekend i was at the hamptons i drove by the hampton social it was completely packed um, that was the one up in Barrington. Um, so with the amount of restaurants here, you may be surprised with how many cars do end up on the, end up on the site. Um, but I understand your concern that, you know, we, we could find ourselves where we have the, the back lot of uh, Jewel uh, empty a lot. So. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Chairman Lencioni. Um, I, it, this is an extremely fair request considering $425,000 is basically us requesting them to front the money to do it. So I'm in 100% support of it. Um, in regards to the parking, one thing that people never want to acknowledge, that's the wrong way to put it. One, people that, one thing that people always forget to consider is that there's probably going to be 100 to 150 employees that are going to be parking on this site 
Like, uh, as you saw, there's going to be 340 employees, so these people are going to be walking to work. They're going to be parking, so you definitely need need the parking to to support it. So, but I'm in total support of this whole project. Thank you very much. Move for approval. Second. I've got a motion by uh, Warball and a second by Petrella. Uh, please call the roll. Bessner? Yes. Weber? Yes. Bukaitis? Yes. Folk? Yes. Bungard? Yes. Munns? Yes. Kim? Yes. Petrella? Yes. Warball? Yes. That passes. Thank you very much. Um, so that takes us to five public comments. Uh, do we have any comment from the public? Uh, Thank you to all students who showed up. I hope uh, this was a good one today. We uh, dealt with a lot of things. Um, seeing the public comments, um, bringing to staff. Yes, just one item. Next week at the Government Operations Committee, we will have Jenna Sawicki from the Business Alliance presenting on some of the um, statistics from, from Scarecrow Fest, but she will also be asking for any programming needs that City Council thinks are not currently being met, just not in relation to Scarecrow, but overall, especially as we enter our first full season in the plaza this year. So if everybody can start thinking about those things in the next week and just come prepared. Um, if there is anything that you want to talk about at that meeting, just wanted to give you a little bit of time to consider that before that meeting. Okay, from programming the uh, other staff comments, other council comments? Okay, uh, seeing that, um, uh, additional items, we had that. So with that, um, we have an executive session um, later, so I need, uh, I need uh, a vote to go to executive session. Motion, motion, yes, motion to go into so executive moved. session. Second. Second by Werbal, so motion by Gam, second by Werbal. Please call the roll. Yes, sir. Yes. Weber. Yes. Fokaitis. Yes. Folks. Yes. Bundar. Yes. Munns. Yes. Gam. Yes. Uncioni. Yes. I'm sorry, Patrona. Yes. We're both. Yes. yes. So we are uh, moving into executive session. We'll take a moment to clear the room. Thank you all for coming tonight.